This is Thursday, February 17, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today uh, Thomas Hunt. Uh, do you prefer Thomas or Tom? Tom is fine. Okay, welcome Tom. Right. Um, may I ask when you were born? Uh, I was born in Boston, uh, September 2nd, 1931. And your current address is now? Here in Natick. I understand that you grew up in Connecticut. Yes. Um, we lived in Newton Center. Uh, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, some years back I, I drove by the old house and I recognized it as this stone house with a little narrow driveway that my father always had trouble getting his Buick car <laughs> into. But um, I think I was around three years old, some three or four maybe, we moved mm -hmm. to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, as people re will remember, that was the time of the Depression. And my dad took a new job, the only one that he could find, um, and he sold the house for one dollar over what the mortgage was. Mm -hmm. And he was lucky to sell it. Right. And, and what, kind of, uh, what kind of job did he do, or did he get? Uh, at that time, he was in uh, the investment field. He worked for um, a brand new mutual fund company. The mutual fund industry was mm -hmm. just beginning in Boston, which of course now it's a huge mm -hmm. part of the Boston economy. But um, things were unwinding very fast, and uh, he got a job down in New York City, and mm -hmm. so we moved to this um, suburb of New York, New Canaan, Connecticut, mm -hmm. which is now a very, very, well, per capita income-wise, it's way up there. Mm -hmm. Very prosperous area. But at the time, it was not? I think it was, mm -hmm. yeah, but um, much more uh, subdued. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't the mega mansions to speak of, that, that kind of thing. It was kind of very conservative, uh -huh. and just a lot of fields and woods that became literally my playground. Uh -huh. So what was it like uh, growing up in Connecticut at that time? Um, well, it was a good time. Um, we uh, moved around a lot in town. Um, my dad was never, it took him a long time to regain his footing financially, so mm -hmm. to speak. And so we didn't have the money to buy a house and we were renting. Mm -hmm. And, um, but basically life, life was very good for me there. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't remember too much in terms of how it was for my brothers. Mm -hmm. I had two brothers at the time. And um, school was a bit of a problem. Uh, I was kind of struggling in the early years, mm -hmm. but um, it was a good life, and that's where I was when the war broke out. Let's talk about that. Uh, do you remember what happened on December 7th, 1941, the attack of Pearl Harbor? Uh, I remember it well. Um, I was riding up, um, we, we lived on, it was, an unpaved road. It was a mm -hmm. dirt road. There were maybe three or four houses on it, and one of which, as I'd indicated, we were renting. And um, I had a friend that lived at the very end house. His name was Bam Dean, nickname. And uh, I was riding my bike, and as I got to his house, he came bursting out the door. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at war. We're at war. Uh, I said, what do you mean? And he said, the uh, Japanese planes have bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. but I knew what war was. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was about, as I remember, it was when we got the news, it was around 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. on December 7th. And I knew, remember how shocked my parents were and Bam's parents were. There was a, a real layer of somberness. Mm -hmm. um, just there. 
What did you know about Europe or Asia before the war? Um, being still a child, uh, not very much. Mm -hmm. um, very, very little. Uh, I, I knew the geography. Okay. I've always been able to kind of picture where things were in my mind, so I sort of knew where Japan was mm -hmm. geographically and where, where Europe was, but nothing really more specific than that. Mm -hmm. Now, before the interview, you mentioned two of your brothers, and did either of them join immediately after the war? I mean, before uh, when the war broke out. Yeah, um, uh, I I was the youngest of the three, mm -hmm. and my oldest brother Bob um, was in uh, private school. He was uh, at a boys' boarding school, uh, the South Kent School in South Kent, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and um, he. Um, he was always pretty oppositional to my parents, as, as I remember him mm -hmm. being. And um, I think that was partly the reason why they decided that a boarding school might be a good thing for him. Mm -hmm. um, he did well. Um, I don't remember, he wasn't outstanding scholastically, but he did well, and he did very well at sports. He was mm -hmm. a captain, I think, of the baseball team. and co-captain of the football team, and he played hockey, mm -hmm. all three sports. And how old was he at the time of Pearl Harbor? Well, he was, when he graduated from South Kent, mm -hmm. um, he was 17. Mm -hmm. And he wanted desperately to become part of the war effort. And so when he went to enlist in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. he uh, I think he fudged his age by a few weeks, mm -hmm. claiming he was 18. Mm -hmm. His birthday was actually August 11th, so I think he kind of moved that up a little bit. And they, of course, were very eager to have him, so he, that's where he went, right after South Kent School, uh, high school in other words, mm -hmm. and into the Marine Corps. And what year was that? Uh, it was. 19, I'm guessing 1942, something okay, like so that. So it was just after Pearl Harbor then. Yeah, yeah. So, and you mentioned another brother. Um, he was the middle brother. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he was killed, unfortunately, oh, uh, not in the war. Mm -hmm. He was not old enough to be in the war. But um, guns were such a big thing um, with boys mm -hmm. and he was with a friend who was playing with a gun and uh, we were now living in a suburb outside of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, my dad, I have to back up a bit okay. mm -hmm. how we got there, my dad wanted desperately mm -hmm. to be part of the war effort in terms of what he was doing um, in his work. And he applied for a commission in the Navy, and um, I don't know where he got the idea <laughs> that he could uh, <laughs> earn a commission in the Navy, but mm -hmm. anyway, he, and they turned him down. But uh, he was a great guy. He plowed ahead and got a job with a munitions uh, factory, a manufacturer uh -huh. of the artillery shells and bombs and that kind of thing. And we were moved to Pittsburgh, and we only, uh, so we lived near Pittsburgh in a mm -hmm. suburb for, I don't know, three months. And they said, we need you in Detroit. So we upped and moved again. Now, my brother is in training, you see, down at Paris Island in the Marine mm -hmm. Corps. We moved to Gross Point, Michigan, just outside of the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of our, we, my brother and I established friendships with guys in school, and it was this particular day that they were playing with this gun, mm -hmm. and it went off point blank into my brother's abdomen. And uh, of course, back then they did not uh, infection and that kind mm -hmm. of thing, and they didn't have the EMT training mm -hmm. that we have and so forth. So he um, 
he succumbed to the uh, to the wound uh, that same day uh, later on. So. Um, my brother Bob came, they, the Marine Corps let him come for the funeral, mm -hmm. and uh, which was in Illinois. That was the family bur burial ground. And um, it's, uh, it's really quite something. In, during that time, you see, culturally, when there was a death in the war, or really non-war, people, they wore black armbands mm -hmm. if there was a death in the family. And um, it didn't, as I said, it didn't necessarily need to be war related. But of course, there were many armbands beginning to appear in, when you went into a public place on trains or bus stations or whatever. An mm -hmm. awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. I was wearing a black armband for my brother Peter as we, as the train, his body was on board the train as we mm -hmm. were bringing it to Illinois. Mm -hmm. So my brother and my family were also. But as I would go through the train, I, I wanted to, I'm a great out of doors guy and my, my the sort of a healing bomb comes from being outdoors. Um, mm -hmm. So I would go to the end of the train, you know, to the observation car and just mm -hmm. stand there. And, but as I would walk through the train, people would reach out and touch my arm strangers just constantly just saying I'm sorry I'm sorry not assuming that mm -hmm. I had lost someone in a war uh, I think that's very reinforcing in terms of mm -hmm. being helpful in the grieving process mm -hmm. especially at su such a young age yes yeah, so. yeah well my condolences for the loss of your oh, brother well mm -hmm. thank you that was it was unfortunate, but mm -hmm. uh, and particularly at the time of, of Bob going off mm -hmm. soon uh, into the war, um, which I'll say more about as, we, as right. we move along. And we are about to move along. So now you're in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Your father's working in a munitions plant. Yes. And now you're about 12, 13 years old. Um, yeah. What was that like? Well, it was, I, you know, Again, school was a struggle for me. Maybe it's because mm -hmm. I've been sort of making so many changes in, in the last few years, in the, you know, leading up to going to Pittsburgh and then Detroit mm -hmm. and moving to several houses in, mm -hmm. in New Canaan even before we made these changes. Um, it was kind of a difficult time for me, but um, I, I, I was taught just to, you know, uh, endure and just, you know, we, we weren't a complaining family mm -hmm. and back in those days we didn't talk about our feelings very much at all. You just didn't do it. What life presented, you just went ahead with what you had. Mm -hmm. So I can say they were, they were the best years I could maybe hope for, mm -hmm. given what was going on. Okay. Talk a little bit about Gross Point during the war. Uh, did you go to the theaters? Were there victory gardens? Um, we had a victory garden, um, you know, the, the timing of this. More of that happened back in New Canaan before mm -hmm. we made these changes to mm -hmm. Pittsburgh and Detroit or Gross Point. Mm -hmm. uh, in New Canaan, yes, we, people had victory gardens, uh, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember carrying pails of water for the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. We had this little plot out in this field. Yeah. And um, because everyone was going off to war, that's all the men, um, young men, uh, I, I got a job after school and on the weekends working in a gas station, mm -hmm. the Walter Barnes Gulf Station. And um, the, uh, you know, I was probably, I don't know, nine or ten or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I could pump gas, and uh, of course we weren't pumping much gas. Um, there were the rationing, we had the mm. A, B, and C stickers, 
Uh, the A sticker was three gallons a week, as I recall. The B sticker, which the A was black and white. Mm -hmm. The B sticker was red and white. Right. That was five gallons. Mm -hmm. And the C sticker, I think, was green and white, but I couldn't be. And I think that was unlimited. P people that were integral to the war effort, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, physicians, for example, they could get as much gas as they wanted. We did a lot of tire changing because mm -hmm. all you couldn't get new, uh, new tires. Uh, tires all went out for recapping, what they call, put mm -hmm. new treads on them. And um, of course, my mother was uh, churning her own butter. Mm. Um, and we had the meat, the red meat stickers, the blue stickers for canned goods, which she called tins. Mm -hmm. um, the um, uh, everyone was, of course, um, being rationed how many cans of peaches or mm -hmm. canned meat or whatever. All of that was was rationed, and um, we also had um, periodic um, um, blackout. Uh, the sirens would pr practice air raid warnings, and down would. You had to have curtains, no mm -hmm. light emitted. Mm -hmm. People prowled the neighborhoods to, and you'd get a knock on the door, of course, if just a little ray of light was showing outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the cars had to have their headlights taped halfway down. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my dad was um, one of the many uh, spotters. They had a, um, a tower set up on an area of town was really the highest area called Turtleback Hill. Mm -hmm. There's a tower. So they'd go up there and scan the horizon with their binoculars, you know, looking for God knows what. I mean, enemy, enemy planes couldn't come in, but... <laughs> you never know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, everyone, everyone sort of was very much involved, and we were buying... Um, uh, we had these booklets that we'd put in 25 cents into the slot, and then after we got $25 of quarters, we would get a bond, or you, mm -hmm. you could um, transfer that and get a $25 war bond. Um, I, I took up knitting, uh, knitting squares for blankets, for example, and uh, so. Um, I would knit as many squares as I could, and then I think my mother would sew them into a blanket. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, we did bandages. We would cut this gauze-like material into these rectangular or square shapes, and um, we would bring those down to the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. um, how about um, listening to the radio or going to movies? Did you do that? Oh, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. the movies, the movie tone, the news, mm -hmm. uh, the black and white, of course, um, which brought the war as close to home as one could, mm -hmm. could expect. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd see the torpedoing of a freighter or a tanker blowing up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all these convoys of ships plowing through the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before the interview uh, the Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, will you uh, tell us what you know about the Normandy? Well, I was this. I was home in bed, I think, uh, with a cold or something, and I had the radio on, and um, the broadcast was was interrupted. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an announcer, it was a voice similar to Edward R. Morrow. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was he, even, I don't remember. But uh, uh, this very controlled but urgent sound, sort of tenor to the voice, mm -hmm. about this fire that had broken out in the Normandy. And so I stayed with that for a number of hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, there were fire boats and the city of New York just pouring water into this mm -hmm. huge ship, uh, which had been a passenger liner, but mm -hmm. then was converted into a troop ship. And then um, 
as I recall, uh, they poured water, and then I had to finally go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But the next morning, the broadcast was still ongoing on the radio, and um, when I tuned it back in, there were um, frantic sound. You could hear people yelling, uh, she's going to go, she's going to go. And I heard this really shrill, creaking, screeching sound as the ship slowly capsized and scraped against the wooden pilings. And you could hear people yelling, you know, to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and it just seemed to go on and mm -hmm. on as this huge, huge, huge transport ship wow. just slowly lay on its side. Do you remember what year that was? I don't specifically, uh, Maureen. I think it was maybe 40, 41, okay. 40. It was er fairly early in the mm -hmm. war. Okay. 42. So let's get back to your brother, who is yep. now in the Marines. Yep. And uh, did he write, or did you write to him? Uh, both. both. Um, as an aside, isn't it amazing people in, in Iraq or Afghanistan now, they talk with their spouses each day or, yeah. you know, either on their <laughs> cell phones or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's, it's really something. Because back then it would be weeks mm -hmm. where letters, and of course every letter was censored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it would be actually cut out with scissors. Um, pieces mm -hmm. of Bob's letter. Um, he first went to Guadalcanal for a uh, so-called cleanup operation. Uh, the main fighting had, uh, had already occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was with the 1st Marine Division. And um, he was, I don't know whether he was then or later, he, he became a squad leader. And um, he was equipped with a Browning automatic rifle, which was a pretty lethal weapon back in those days. Very heavy. Mm -hmm. He was a very good marksman. And this is where um, he uh, he was uh, in the second wave in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And um, if you remember Okinawa, it was a different from Iwo Jima, for mm -hmm. example, where I believe it was the third Marines, later backed up by the first Marines. Not clear about that, but um, where the assault was immediately met by the Japanese on the beaches, I mean, you know, even before then in their landing crafts coming in. Okinawa, as I recall, is a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of waited in ambush almost. But my brother escaped any fire c coming in. Um, but then he did receive a couple of wounds. Mm -hmm. and. Um, he never would talk about this. And I need to say in much later years, after he'd returned and mm -hmm. um, had his family, we'd have these family reunions, and I, um, I, a few times I would ask him about certain things. And he put, his eyes would almost flash, you know, in a way that was, it was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, do not go there with me. I see. But what we do know, what happened to him in Okinawa, was not told by him. And I never even dared to ask him if what I knew was true. Mm -hmm. But my mother had a premonition, and this is back in the New Canaan era, you see. This is, we hadn't quite moved on, or is it? Mm -hmm. Memory's a little hazy there. No, we came back to New Canaan. That's right. Mm -hmm. We came back to New Canaan after my brother had been killed, accidentally killed by the shotgun accident. Mm -hmm. My mother wanted to sort of come back home. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And Dad stayed out in Detroit, so Mother and I came back. Okay. And it was during that time, my mother had this premonition, and um, she told uh, uh, she told me and my father um, that uh, something bad has happened to Bob. And it was not long, I don't know whether it was days or weeks, but not long, when my mother did get a call. Uh, Dad had to go back to Detroit. He'd come back and forth periodically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my mother got a call from um, an officer in the Marine Corps who came to the house <coughs> and described what happened to my brother in being wounded. Um, the first wound came um, the Japanese soldiers retreated to caves in Okinawa. That was a big part of, and so they had to be um, killed mm -hmm. uh, using, f the Marines used flamethrowers. And once an area was uh, cleared of the enemy, of the Japanese, mm -hmm. I hate to use that, mm. but that's, okay. that's what they were called. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the area had a green flag, and so there had been a skirmish up there the day before, and my brother lost his weapon, the BAR, mm -hmm. and uh, I suspect there was some hand-to-hand -hand combat. The, the Marine officer wasn't totally clear about that, but he surmised that's what happened. So my brother went back up to retrieve his weapon and he was sitting on a stump smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. and he just suddenly he got this kind of and he jumped up just then when a Japanese soldier had come up crept up behind with his bayonet uh -huh. and um, my brother was uh, stabbed in the leg probably would have been in his neck had he not jumped up and so and this fellow had been badly burned he had, the Japanese soldier had survived the flame th thrower, and mm -hmm. it was presumed that everyone was dead, but a, they had missed this fellow. Mm -hmm. So that's where a wound occurred. Then later, uh, my brother with his squad was on night patrol. And on night patrol, you didn't wear helmets mm -hmm. because they, they gave too much of a, of a a silhouette or outline, and they would wear just soft caps. Mm -hmm. But my brother had on a, his helmet uh, against standard operating procedures because he had this apparently this horrible cold and he didn't want to get his head wet. It was raining, it was pouring. And according to the story that was told, um, they, they stopped and kind of had a, a smoke break. Mm -hmm. And this, this fellow came near my brother and uh, said, have you got a light or something or other? And my brother picked up that there was a slight accent. He didn't, um, and you know, it was, so it was pitch dark out, it was pouring rain and they're all coming around. Right. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't see the face apparently, but I, the voice. And suddenly he realized that they had been, because then he saw more people around than were in his squad. Wow. And they'd been infiltrated. So a firefight emerged and my brother received a bullet right through the helmet. Had he had a soft cap on, he would have been dead. But the right. helmet did what it's supposed to do and the bullet went in and circled around and came out the back end. So um, he, was, he was taken out as wounded and actually He'd gotten wounded in the hand as well. I don't know whether it was that fight or the when the bayonet thing. So he was taken out of action and and uh, went to the rear and, mm -hmm. and recovered quickly. And um, and then it was not long where the the bomb was dropped on 
Hirosh Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was home listening to the radio when that was dropped. And the announcer, it was so, it was so astonishing, so utterly incomprehensible. The, the announcer had never really, you could tell he did not know mm -hmm. what an atomic bomb. Right. And had trouble describing what this thing mm. was. That, that well, not too many people knew at that exactly. time. Exactly. Mm. And uh, so I, I heard this announcement of the bomb being dropped. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, very soon the Japanese surrendered after that. Mm -hmm. And um, so my brother was, um, they didn't send him home, they sent him up to North China for uh, with his uh, division um, for some kind of duty and he mm -hmm. was on an outpost up there for a number of months. Um, very cold. Mm -hmm. And then finally he came home. Mm -hmm. and, um, Do you remember when he came home? Yes, but uh, very vaguely, he was very withdrawn, mm -hmm. quiet. Uh, what, what year was it, 45, 46? Yeah, I was going to say it was probably around, uh, it was later in 45, mm -hmm. maybe the first part of 46. That, that timing is a bit... Okay. So by this time, you're about 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming in high school? Yeah. Or were you in public high school or private? No, I, I went to Westminster School. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not doing well uh, in school, and my, my parents dropped me, more or less, on the doorstep of Westminster School. Mm -hmm. But it turned out uh, I was there from 46 to 1950, mm -hmm. and um, it turned out to really be one of the most important or pivotal times in my life because I really, for the first time, began to knuckle down mm -hmm. academically and get settled down emotionally and just a lot of things have been going on mm -hmm. and this was just, this was the, the structure and discipline that the school gave me was so extremely helpful. And where is the Westminster School? It's in Simsbury, Connecticut and it's, uh, I'm still connected with the school in terms of I, I make annual donations and I mm -hmm. go to events occasionally down there and mm -hmm. I stay in touch with my classmates, most of whom, most of us are mm -hmm. still alive. Good. We, we've mm -hmm. lost three of them, but oh. it was mm -hmm. a little school. There were yeah. four, well, there were five forms, but um, 130 mm -hmm. in the whole school. So now the end of the war, um, is your father still in Michigan? Did he come back to Connecticut? He came back to Connecticut and mm -hmm. um, uh, he, um, he later uh, became um, involved, he was one of the principal um, officers of this Air Freight Corporation, mm -hmm. um, it was known as Emory Air Freight Corporation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, John Emory had been in the Air Force during the war and learned a lot about logistics and he had this idea mm -hmm. of of an air freight uh, becoming air freight forwarder and that had never been done. Emory mm -hmm. was the first one and I remember John Emory coming over to my dad and um, selling him on the idea of leaving this job that he had with some bank in New York to come and be with him mm -hmm. in the launching of this air freight corporation. And they'd be out in the driveway and they were writing numbers in the in the gravel, uh, mm -hmm. it was a sandy gravel driveway, and um, so Dad did. He took that risk mm -hmm. and um, went from a decent salary to practically nothing for a number of years. Really? Okay, so uh, let's go back a little bit before we leave World War II. You were mentioning before the interview an incident in New Hampshire regarding a family in an escaped German POW. Yeah, this was a place uh, um, on, a, on a lake. Um, mm -hmm. I won't name it, but mm -hmm. uh, it was um, 
more or less central New Hampshire, one of the many, you know, typical New Hampshire lakes. And uh, there was a family that lived uh, in this beautiful house that they built mm -hmm. during the Depression. And uh, this family and my parents were very close friends for years and years. And so we would go up there each summer for a couple of weeks. And as part of this um, beautiful home, stone home, they had built this boat house with a little apartment and mm -hmm. so we would that's where we would go for a couple of weeks and each summer and we did this for I don't know many many years and then the war came and um, uh, the woman in the house she and her mother were alone uh, mm -hmm. she was divorced and um, just the two of them but they did have a kind of like a, a caretaker and um, uh, he was away, he was down in Concord for the day, but mm -hmm. was expected back. And he always carried a pistol. It was during the war years. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, um, one of the two women was at the, were washing dishes and looked up and saw this face, bearded face peering into the window. And she, it was the mother, and she whispered to her daughter, uh, that there was a man there and um, then they both looked and he was gone and then they heard someone coming in the back door mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> excuse me when I was talking with them about this later they were more they weren't so much afraid of the German they knew who as soon as he came in okay. mm -hmm. who, who he probably was and um, they were more afraid of Scotty, the kind of caretaker, mm -hmm. who was armed. And should he appear, things could get out of control quickly. Mm -hmm. So they were feeding him. And sure enough, they looked up and saw, it was snowing out hard, mm -hmm. but they saw lights coming down the long driveway. And the German prisoner uh, took, I guess, apparently the cue from the two women, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he ran out the back door mm -hmm. across the lake, and they never, that was it. Because apparently there was a German POW camp nearby? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get back to your brother for a moment. What, uh, what happened to him after the war? Uh, he... Um, he went to Dartmouth College mm -hmm. under the, there was a, you know, a government for veterans and, but he had a, he had a very difficult time mm -hmm. settling down and it just didn't work out academically. He just couldn't concentrate. Mm -hmm. And so he had to drop out and he joined Emory Air Freight. And did very well. He became what is known as a, a station manager, and he and his he was then married, and mm -hmm. um, he'd be transferred to many different Indianapolis, um, um, some place in California, I think near Los Angeles mm -hmm. for a few years, and then he was in Detroit area for a few years, and then back to Connecticut for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then in Boston, I know he was always being, every three or four years he'd be transferred. Um, had, a, had a wonderful family. His wife died of cancer, mm -hmm. his first wife. And um, Bob remarried and then he got cancer mm -hmm. and died just two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, a, a esophageal cancer. And um, uh, he, he died in typical Robert P. Hunt fashion. Uh, he didn't want to talk about mm -hmm. what he was going through. He was very impatient. Mm -hmm. um, and his wife found him. He, he died in their home in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And what sounded to me like he just pulled the oxygen line out and just said, I'm out of here. 
I don't, I don't need the agony of all of this. Mm -hmm. And that would be typical of the, the way he had, a, he was tough mm -hmm. and, and he was a very courageous guy. Mm. All right, let's uh, get back to you. It's now the early 50s. You're out of Westminster. I understand you were nearly drafted into the Korean War. Tell us about that. I was the only um, member of my class at Westminster mm -hmm. who elected not to apply to college. I didn't know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to, to study. And um, I, I've always been kind of connected in as um, at work. work. Work has been my salvation. Mm -hmm among other things. Um, recall that when I was eight, nine, ten years, I was working in the gas station. Mm -hmm. um, so going to college right after prep school or high school was, I thought, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. And I got a job working in a factory making chicken wire. Now, I don't know how I entered uh, at this job in the factory. Um, I just don't remember that detail. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not an indoor person very much, but there I was. As, but I was one of the very few young workers. They were all older men mm -hmm. working at these weaving machines, uh -huh. weaving this, this wire, these wire products, mm -hmm. chicken wire, and mm -hmm. different dimensions of it. Uh -huh. And the company bought two brand new high-speed wire machines, wire weaving machines. Mm -hmm. They would do the work of about 20 of these old people working these old, it's like the old linotype machines mm -hmm. making right. type. Well, that, so one day the foreman came along and said, hey, you, come here. And put me on one of these new machines along mm -hmm. with the rest of the young young guys, we were nimble enough to be able to operate these machines. Mm -hmm. And we figured out that if we got roller skates on this nice new factory floor, we could roller skate around when wires would get hung up on the spools uh -huh. and, and unspool it, get the machine back up running because we were paid by, we were piece rate. Mm -hmm. We were filling up boxcars of fencing wire. Mm -hmm. And we did this for a number of months before the company accountant caught on because we were making more money, I think, than the president of the company. I don't know <laughs> that. but the, So they quickly changed how we were reimbursed. Mm -hmm. And my money went down. My dad said, you've earned twice what I've earned. And you've only been there in, in the same period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've only been there four months or whatever. All my friends were going off to college and I decided that I would go ahead as they, and so I left and I applied to Colby College in mm -hmm. Maine. I said, where do you, where do I want to go? I don't, all, a lot of the prep school people go to the Ivy Leagues. Right. But that didn't, that didn't appeal to me at all to even think about that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, uh, there was this um, teacher at Westminster who was this really magnificent person. Mm -hmm. And I had so much respect and he went to Colby College and mm -hmm. I said to myself, if it was good enough for John Gow, it's got to be good enough for me. And so I called the dean's office, well, we've already started our semester, but yes, we do have room, you mm -hmm. want to take a chance? Have your transcripts sent up. Of course, no faxing then. It went by U.S. Right. mail. Mm -hmm. Take a chance. So I piled everything I owned in my little two-door Ford sedan and drove to Waterville, Maine, never having seen the college in my mm -hmm. life. And uh, I had my interview, mm -hmm. and they took me in as a freshman. Wow. So I understand, but... Uh, what was your military life like? Uh, you were now in Colby, and 
you you did not go um, you went into the army but it was after Korea yeah Korea was was ongoing and mm -hmm. you know I have to say I was I was talking with a friend of mine who was very he was a sergeant mm -hmm. Went in as a private, but in Korea he was elevated to be a sergeant. He he was a heavy mor sergeant in a heavy mortar company, and he has told me some things about his war experience that I know he hasn't told, spoken about with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one day we were he and I were together kayaking, which we did from time to time, um, and he was talking about his Korean experience. And it suddenly dawned on me, Maureen, that I, th I had to call myself a draft dodger. Really? And that was, um, I, I just, I recoiled at that, but I said to myself, you know, listening to my friend who left Harvard to go into the war, because mm -hmm. as he said, this is what my family did. Mm -hmm. When country, when duty calls, you go. This has came from a long line of military people mm -hmm. in his family. I didn't think in that vein uh, at all, and uh, so I, you know, I, in some ways, part of me, I should have gone under the same, uh, with the same kind of thinking that it was a duty to do that. Mm -hmm. It never even occurred to me. My, my first impulse was, if I don't get into college now, if I keep delaying, I may never go. That mm -hmm. was the rationale. So, but it was years later that this other kind of thought came to my mind about mm -hmm. what that kind of meant. Okay. So, uh, but you did serve in the Army. Yeah. The, um, when I, when I graduated from Colby, I volunteered for the draft immediately because, mm -hmm. of course, back then they did have the draft. There was no, there was no um, lottery or numbers that you right. went in. And so I thought, just get this thing going. Mm -hmm. And um, so I volunteered and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I think something like Ninety or ninety-five percent of us were all college graduates. All <laughs> volunteered for the mm -hmm. draft, and uh, for basic training in Fort Dix, it was it was something else. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. and I, I have memories of getting off the bus, you know, and going to the quartermaster and getting our uniforms, and and then. Every harassment constantly, even before we got in our uniforms. You know, we do these police calls, you know, picking up cigarette wrappers off the ground. You know, uh, walking on all fours, making mm -hmm. sure that it was it was wild. Um, the company um, sergeant that we had was a company. Yeah, I think it was a company. I don't remember what company I was in, but anyway. He was this tall, um, distinguished um, African American, mm -hmm. and I later learned Indian, American Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, this tall, slender, just loaded with medals. He was a master sergeant, I mm -hmm. believe. His name was Sergeant Anastasia. The name. And all of us were so caught up by his way of leading and commanding, of, of being a master sergeant for a bunch of clucks like <laughs> we all were. Mm -hmm. And we turned it into this most competitive with all other companies. It was Abel, Baker, Charlie, Dog, mm -hmm. Easy, Fox Company. And we wanted to be the number one in the battalion, if not the regiment, mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. So we really worked for this guy. So he didn't really have to do much with us, mm. which he later told us, because we brought him, when we were finished our training, we had this big beard drunken 
fast and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we made him really the center the center point of our whole training mm -hmm. exercise I mean he had been Second World War in Vietnam or uh, Korea and had been a very distinguished soldier mm -hmm. and what a powerful model for all of us which we recognized okay so you served in Germany I went from Fort Dix mm -hmm. down to Camp Gordon, Georgia, uh -huh. to high-speed radio school. High-speed radio. Mm -hmm. They issued us so-called winter clothing. I'd never been so cold in my life as <laughs> I was in Augusta, Georgia, at Camp Gordon, because mm -hmm. the winter clothing was just a shell of a jacket. There was no, oh, it was awful. <laughs> and um, so, I got off to a kind of rocky start down there because I met up with this guy who wanted to go in and drink some beer and at this saloon somewhere off off base. We didn't have a pass. Oh we dear. Just, we just went down there, mm -hmm. forget how we got there, and watched, I don't know, baseball game on the TV and mm -hmm. drank beer and came back. We were hitching back and who should, who should pick us up but the company officer. Oh dear. <laughs> but we were brand new and he uh -huh. was sort of wondering, you know, but he'd been out having a few himself, I mm -hmm. think. So anyway, we we escaped from that one okay. Mm -hmm. We knew that we had been let off the hook. You're right. And so we learned from that not not to take advantage of that kind mm -hmm. of leniency. Right. And there again, we all worked very hard to be mm -hmm. the best operators, radio operators that we could. It was a very cohesive mm -hmm. group. Um, then I was uh, assigned to um, to go to Germany, mm -hmm. and um, by then I was dating this woman, um, and uh, who I wanted to see uh, before I left, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they had a, um, we traveled by train, those that wanted to go home for a few days at Christmas from Camp Gordon, um, and I went to New York City, and then Susan came and we, mm -hmm. we met for a few hours, and then I had to get on the return train back. <laughs> it was crazy, but yeah. mm -hmm. then I did the same thing, but I snuck out, we got to Camp Kilmer, mm -hmm. and we were going to have this turnaround, a little bit of a turnaround time. So Susan's agreed to meet me again at at uh, Grand Central Station, mm -hmm. and I snuck out and grabbed a train from wherever Camp Kilmer is in New Jersey mm -hmm. to New York. Spent a couple of hours just at the train station. Mm -hmm. Came back. Day later, went back to New York with my unit. Got on the troop ship. Mm -hmm. Ran into a North Atlantic storm, Ooh. which was there were 700 of us on board, and I think 695 were violently sick, and I escaped that. And um, we pulled into um, Rotterdam and uh, under very tight security conditions because they were still worried about uh, mines. So we were, the watertight compartment doors were closed on the troop ship and we had to mm -hmm. move very slowly through. And, and um, so then I was assigned to the second armored division, put on a tr troop train mm -hmm. and went to bomb holder, which turned out, as I found out, was General Rommel's, the German General Panzer Division. So that was his training program, mm -hmm. uh, uh, compound. Mm -hmm. And the floors were, you know, three feet of reinforced concrete to carry heavy tanks. Uh -huh. And it was really, it was this fortress kind of place. And uh, so that's where I was. And but there again, I no sooner got assigned there than I was put on a jeep and driven to this top of this mountain to be a relay radio operator um, for the 82nd Reconnaissance Battalion. 
and all we ate were, the only food they would bring out to us was bread and mm -hmm. eggs. <laughs> that's it? <laughs> that was, that's all I remember. Oh. And I almost died up there, literally. We were mm -hmm. on a half track and I had closed it all up, it was cold, and carbon monoxide. And I just suddenly, mm -hmm. I realized what was going on and I staggered towards the, mm -hmm. and opened the rear door and um, uh, for fresh air. And I did pass out, but only briefly. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up my, another guy that was there mm -hmm. to take over. And this is now about 1950? 50, 50, 55. Okay, 55. Yeah. And we were always on maneuvers because that mm -hmm. was the height of the Cold War. And uh, so, and being in a reconnaissance battalion, um, we were constantly on maneuvers in a certain sector of Germany. Mm -hmm. So we would know the terrain and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so these were very active kind of war training in the event that the Soviets, mm -hmm. um, the Cold War became hot. And exactly what part of, uh, I'm, I'm assuming West Germany, were you stationed? Well, Baumholder was way over on the, um, as you look at a map of Germany, mm -hmm. it would be on the uh, western side, western side, almost mm -hmm. in France, mm -hmm. with Belgium to the north. Mm -hmm. We were right near the, the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. area, and um, it was a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. Then our unit was transferred to, uh, to Mainz, mm -hmm. and um, uh, near, it wasn't far from Wiesbaden. I, I would, whenever I was in camp, which wasn't that often, because as I say, we're always on maneuvers. Right. The, um, uh, I would go to Wiesbaden to attend mm -hmm. a, a concert. You could do it for like 10 cents American money. Mm -hmm. It was um, beautiful concerts in the concert hall. And Wiesbaden, we had a big air base there, still do, I think. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and how long were you stationed in uh, Germany? Uh, it was about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. My the enlistment or the uh, draft, you were drafted for two years. Okay. And what rank were you? Private first class. Okay. I should have been, but I was the kind of guy that I, I, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Oops. And <laughs> I irritated the company's, company sergeant mm -hmm. who has the power, I mean, and he told me, I can't use the words that he used, <laughs> that I would never make corporal. Mm -hmm. So uh, the end of your army stint was in 1956? 56, 56. Yep, got out in June. Uh -huh. And what happened after that? Um, I, uh, of course, was honorably discharged and I uh, drove to Waterville, Maine to mm -hmm. see my fiance, who's now my wife, mm -hmm. and um, uh, she she was uh, graduating mm -hmm. and um, at Colby, and um, I always said I would never marry a co-ed, but you know the never <laughs> never say never kind right. of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, and then we were married that September. Mm -hmm. uh, and started our married life in Vermont, uh, in St. Albans. And uh, I was working for, I got a job there. Mm -hmm. I, um, I got in my car after, um, well, actually before we were married, um, uh, that summer, and I had it just in mind just to start life out in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would drive into a town if I saw a factory, back to the chicken wire factory, right. you uh -huh. see. Uh, the fa you can do factory, Tom. Mm -hmm. I was a geology major at Colby, mm -hmm. which was kind of crazy looking for a, but back then they had training programs, um, management training, mm -hmm. and that's really what I was looking for. I see. And so, um, some of the places I stopped at were really interesting, little factories, I'm sure they're gone now. Mm -hmm. um, but I stopped at St. Albans at the National Carbon Company, which is a division of 
you know, the Ever Ready flashlight and right. battery. That's mm -hmm. where they were, the flashlights were made there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess they were impressed enough with maybe potential and sent me to Cleveland for some training and um, then back to Vermont. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started out. And uh, I was with Union Carbide uh, National Carbon Division for a couple of years and then left and um, went to the, um, had an interview with the first boss. I was traveling all the mm -hmm. time and with young, we had our first, our daughter. Mm -hmm. I just hated to come Sunday, get in the car and leave my wife and child. And I was, I was driving out, I'd gotten to the New York state line. Um, I believe it was on the turnpike, mm -hmm. maybe it was Route 20, I don't know. But I said, you know, I don't want to do this. I turned around, came back, and, uh, and decided to try to get a job in the finance area, following again my dad's footsteps. Right. Mm -hmm. And which I did, and um, uh, worked for the first Boston Corporation. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I was there, and I was I was doing well, and um, but. Um, there had been this gnawing, gnawing pull for years that I kind of ignored, and that was a call to the ministry. Really? And um, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the army contemplating that as mm -hmm. an idea, as an idea, as mm -hmm. a concept. It's, it sounds kind of clinical, but that's mm -hmm. the way I approached it. Mm -hmm. But then it became became more sort of an emotionally less, not such a cognitive, but an emotional kind of connection that I was making. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a long story, which I won't go, but I did, I did resign from First Boston mm -hmm. and went to seminary with a wife and two children. And that's a leap of faith with not a lot of financial resources. Okay. I, now what uh, what year was this? Around what time? Uh, that was in 1970, no, 64. 64. 64. And what kind of ministry? Well, of course, I, I had to get my degree and I, mm -hmm. I, I was there at Andover Newton Seminary in Newton for two years. They require um, a unit of clinical pastoral training mm -hmm. and in that time it was they were always in a hospital setting so i was assigned to worcester state hospital mm -hmm. and this was when they had three thousand mentally ill patients wow. just before they had just started the pharmacological interventions of drugs mm -hmm. but all the floors were occupied with people um, who were severely psychotic uh -huh. and um, I mean it took my my first assignment it took me half an hour to get through the building they, they had these big keys mm -hmm. to unlock and then lock and the patients would be reaching out some would be defecating in the corners mm -hmm. and it was just you know it was but I found that ministry I could make some build some relationships with some of these very sick people. And I just found the chaplaincy, that direct hands-on ministry to be, like, that's where I, this is where I want to be. Mm -hmm. But I'd run out of money. So back to the business world for some a few years. Mm -hmm. And then I left, came back, finished my training. Mm -hmm went on for specialized training for chaplaincy to become certified. Mm -hmm. And my, my calling had been fulfilled and spent 18 years of very satisfying ministry. Most of that time was at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and Hospital where I was chaplain there for 10 or 11 years, and mm -hmm. then I was there in another capacity. 
uh, working in the intensive with families, patients mm -hmm. in the intensive care, the surgical and trauma units, mm -hmm. and was a uh, adjunct faculty in the medical school as a co-facilitator with a group of students, uh, first year medical students, mm -hmm. and basically what is known as communication skills, relationship right. building, how mm -hmm. to the doctor-patient relationship, how to enhance that and make it part of the healing process. And so I, that was wonderful working with that group of students. And then I was also a training supervisor for, um, for clergy. Mm -hmm. And during this time you were living in Sherbin? We uh, partly, yes, well partly in Framingham but, and, then, then, and then Sherbin, yes. Okay. Yep. And you recently moved to Natick. Yep. Well, we went to Maine for a few years. We left uh -huh. Sherburne, went to Maine where our daughter lives. Uh -huh. you know, um, and um, uh, to uh, Brunswick, where mm -hmm. Bowdoin College. And, um, uh, but you know, nearly 40 years of relationships, a, a lot of our friends were facing some serious health issues and so forth. We were driving back and forth, right? we right. decided mm -hmm. to come back, mm -hmm. in a sense, what was home. So we decided to downsize and, and found this very nice place, mm -hmm. the condominium uh, here in Natick, mm -hmm. which we've always liked anyway. Mm -hmm. We've liked mm -hmm. being neighbors of yep. Natick. And you're still married? Yes. And yep. you uh, mentioned two children? Yep. Our, uh, our daughter lives in Brunswick, as still. I mentioned, mm -hmm. and our son lives in um, Litchfield, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, they're both teachers. Our daughter Leslie is, a, call her a specialist in, um, uh, uh, she does remedial work and mm -hmm. tutoring, uh, doing a lot of SAT tutoring right mm -hmm. now. And our son teaches in a prep school, mm -hmm. uh, not South Kent, but Kent school, uh -huh. teaches English. And he's an author. and. Um, uh, was published by um, Random House. Mm -hmm. um, book didn't sell a whole whole lot, mm -hmm. but he didn't expect that. Right. Um, and we have three grandchildren. Yeah. Mm. And um, uh, one of whom graduated. Matthew graduated mm -hmm. uh, from St. Lawrence mm -hmm. University last June, and he's struggling to get a mm -hmm. job. He's one of these typical, or not un, not mm -hmm. untypical. Mm -hmm. um, He's working two or three jobs up in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. A little of this, a little of that. Right. Our granddaughter is going to be a graduate at Hamilton College mm -hmm. uh, with a degree of Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, and she's casting around now for a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, our third, um, Eben, is at Northeastern. He's a freshman, mm -hmm. and he wants to go into business. He knows exactly, he wants to be in the business end of professional sports. Not a bad field to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and in a good city for, for mm -hmm. that. And of course, as you know, Northeastern has that intern program. Mm. So You know it well. So Mr. Hunt, any other, any finishing comments um, about those who will be seeing this uh, videotape DVD in the future? Um, let me just check and make sure. Oh, um, yeah, there were two things going back in my mm -hmm. New Canaan years that I remembered just this morning. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're back now to uh, in the 40-41 um, era. Mm -hmm. um, I would be fascinated watching the fighter pilots, and I don't know where they were out of, uh, the, what we assumed were practice strafing runs on these barns in New Canaan. We had a barn in wow. the house we were renting. And they would swoop down to these very low altitudes, you know, as if they were going to uh -huh. strafe and then pull up. Mm -hmm. um, there was the P 38, I remember, that it was a, a very fast, and then of course the Mustang. Mm -hmm. But it was mainly the P-38 that I remember. It was, I don't know whether it's the same guy, but he would every once in a while come back and mm -hmm. strafe our barn. 
Then I would remember at night um, being woken by the, um, the house would almost rumble and shake mm -hmm. from the squadrons of bombers going overhead. And presumably they were, they were on their way over to Europe mm -hmm. or to England, right. most probably. And, and I learned how to differentiate between, I could lay there and I'd say, those are 17s mm -hmm. or those are 24s, B-20 bombers, mm -hmm. four engine. And, and then there was the B-26 and the B-25. They were two engine. Mm -hmm. And they all had different engine sounds. I've, I've always been attuned to sounds and mm -hmm. um, mechanical sounds. And uh, I'd think, well, those are the 25s or whatever. <laughs> And uh, every once in a while, uh, an antique plane, like we were, when we were in Brunswick, they had mm -hmm. these air shows once in a while. And the, the 26s and 25s, and they were all there. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have to look up. I knew they were there. Mm -hmm. As the brother of a veteran and a veteran yourself, is there anything you want to say to those who will be watching this about uh, serving one's country? Well, yeah, there's, uh, when VJ Day, Victory in Japan, and Victory in VE Day, mm -hmm. Victory in Europe, the whole town gathered, um, kind of like in the village square. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember that. I even remember being there when Roosevelt's death was announced. Mm -hmm. It was like the whole town almost mm -hmm. converged, this sense of community. And that sense of community, um, we were all together in the war effort. Um, we all wanted to be part of the sacrifice, however way we could make it. And um, I think we've lost that ability to be part of a shared sacrifice. I mean, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq None of us have been asked to sacrifice a thing for that, except, of course, those who have lost mm -hmm. a son or a daughter or a husband, brother, sister. Um, life has just gone on. We, we, don't, we don't have that gathering around. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I, I think about that mm -hmm. in juxtaposition to where we were in that, during the war years. And the same could be said in Vietnam and Korea. We, we weren't really unified and mm -hmm. into that mode of sacrifice other than those who have lost people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just, it's important. A war is, we, we, we need to think more about what it means to be part of a community um, and uh, to be connected with those who have given such a supreme, um, it sounds cliche, the supreme sacrifice, mm -hmm. but that can't say it any better than that, really. Yes. Mr. Yeah. Hunt, thank you so much for participating in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. We really do appreciate your firsthand experiences of the home front, your brother, um, your brother's. Uh, I don't want to say sacrifice either, but uh, your brother's efforts in the Pacific and, of course, your own experiences in Germany during the Cold War. We thank you for coming. Well, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Very mm -hmm. much. Thank you for mm -hmm. asking me to be yeah, a part. Mm -hmm. It was my pleasure.